So this is all part of my October tour, the ancient history and mysteries, esoteric Egypt tour, where we will be getting access for our group inside the Sphinx enclosure, which is not available to the general public. We do so early in the morning. It's part of a sunrise visit with the Sphinx, where we will have the Giza Plateau all to ourselves. Let's go. <laughs> What's up everybody, NEXT here. It's 4.11 in the morning and I am getting ready to go to the Great Sphinx of Egypt. We are now on our way to see the Sphinx at 4.45 a.m. for a special private viewing that I arranged for my group. And we are so excited to be able to experience this ancient monument before the Giza Plateau opens up for the general public because it's really something special to be able to experience this without the crowds at this early hour following in the footsteps of those from antiquity who have come to seek audience from this massive limestone statue which was once considered an oracle the sphinx should need no introduction especially if you are already a subscriber to this channel but if you are new here consider hitting the subscribe button and clicking the bell icon to receive notifications when I drop new videos like this one. The Sphinx is arguably the most spectacular sculpture on earth. And even if you accept the academic point of view, that is that the Sphinx is believed to have been fashioned around 2500 BC, it still makes it one of the oldest and most iconic structures in the world. But there's numerous alternative theories some of which we will cover today from inside the enclosure. For most, getting the chance to see the Sphinx up close and personal is a dream come true. And the fact that we get to do this at such an early hour makes it even more special. You really can't wait to see the sunrise over the Sphinx and take in all the beauty and mystery of this iconic structure. It's an experience you'll never forget. So you'll wanna stay tuned to see all the highlights of our early morning adept expedition. The way that we're going to approach the Sphinx in honor and, oh, and tradition of my mentor, the late, great John Anthony West, is we're going to approach quietly, slowly, ceremonially, and we'll take about 10 or 15 minutes or so just to be confronted with the Sphinx in silence. We'll observe silence. So, if you're into meditating, that sort of thing, you're free to do so. If you want to take some photos, but we just asked that during the approach, we approach silently and just take in and experience the Sphinx before we begin our presentation. Then from there, I will begin with an introduction to the Sphinx. We'll gather around between the paws and tell you a bit about the history and the mysteries of the great Sphinx of Egypt. And then we'll begin to take you around inside the Sphinx enclosure, also known as the Sphinx Ditch, which again is not available to the general public. This is exclusive access for this group and we will have it for two hours. And then as we mentioned yesterday during the orientation, we will leave for breakfast. It's okay to leave your things on the bus. If there's anything you wanna leave on the bus, they will be safe. And again, we'll approach quietly slowly, ceremonially. And if you look to your right, you'll notice the Sphinx should shortly come into view. Uh, one quick question I forgot to ask yesterday uh, during the orientation. So as everyone here is probably familiar with by now, both Kaylee and I are, are bloggers and YouTubers and we get a lot of footage, video footage. Uh, from time to time, sometimes you may be on some of the footage. We don't have to put that out. I just want to get a quick, I forgot to do this yesterday at the meeting, but is there anyone that is not comfortable? So for example, we take video and that video could end up on YouTube. Is there, you show of hands, is there anyone that does not want to be seen on YouTube or in the footage? Anyone? Everyone here is okay if you end up in the footage? Most people usually are, some aren't. We just want to be sensitive toward that sort of thing. Can I request that I do be seen? 
I'll, I'll make best efforts. <laughs> Most people usually enjoy it, but again, some for privacy reasons don't. So, uh, and if that's the case, and I get you on footage, I'll always try to edit you out. But it seems like this group is pretty much game for anything. So that said, welcome to the Great Sphinx. We will approach quietly, slowly, ceremonially. Enjoy. sky while the sphinx is still in the darkness with the pink sky behind it it's quite magical to be honest Seven feet high, 270 feet long. What you are confronted with today is the Great Sphinx of Egypt, known by many names throughout history. Ra Harakde, the solar principle. Hore Maket, Horus of the horizon. Seshep Unk Atum, living image of Atum. Abu Hol, the terrifying one, father of terror. Tefnu, the spit of Nu, and recent textual evidence has revealed an ancient name of Mehit. The Sphinx is not only an emblem of Egypt, <clears throat> but it is arguably the most spectacular sculpture on earth, and its mysteries are many fold. Egyptologists and archaeologists such as Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass are convinced that there's nothing more to see. Move along. However, esoteric documentation and alternative research suggest otherwise. I, some of you may be familiar, I've had a documentary uh, video on my YouTube channel entitled Sphinx Explain, Hidden Entrances, Origins, and Identities for the Sphinx. What is it that we know about the Sphinx? Well, in Masonic tradition, the Sphinx is guardian of the mysteries, keeper of ancient secrets. But how do we, the uninitiated, know about the Sphinx today? What we know about the Sphinx comes down to us from Greek tradition, where legend relates how the Sphinx had the body of a winged lion and the head of not a man, but a woman. And she terrorized the citizens of Thebes, the Greek, not the Egyptian. Puzzling passengers with a riddle, what goes on four feet, on two feet, and then on three? But the longer it goes, the weaker it be devouring all those who failed to answer, until along came Oedipus, who realized the answer. The answer to the mystery was, anyone? Man. It is man who as an infant crawls on all four, who through growth stands upright on two, and who through old age and senescence begins to walk with a staff or a cane, effectively has three legs. So Oedipus may have realized the mystery of the Greek Sphinx, but the Great Sphinx of Egypt may still hold a secret. What do we know in terms of its age? From Egyptology, we understand that the Sphinx is attributed to the Old Kingdom, and it is believed to be the identity of Khafra. So we have the Great Pyramid of Egypt over here. This is Khufu. Behind us, we have Khafra and then Menkare. And we'll talk about some of the evidence and why the Egyptologists believe it's attributed to Khafra. However, early explorers that came here suggested that the Sphinx may be a woman. They, they see a woman in the face of the Sphinx. 
particularly when we go on the side and you look at the side profile, it tends to have uh, features that are reminiscent of a sub-Saharan African woman. And so the Sphinx is said to have been fashioned in the Old Kingdom. How? How was this accomplished? It wasn't built, it is a sculpture. All of the stone that you see, we're, we're in now, it's called the Sphinx Enclosure. Some refer to this as the Sphinx Ditch. The stone was removed from inside the enclosure and used to build the temple that is directly in front of the Sphinx. And the temple over here to the side, this is called the Sphinx Temple, and this one is the Khafra Valley Temple. You see these giant, enormous megalithic stones. All of this was quarried from around the Sphinx, which fashioned it and gave it its body. And so again, we're told that the Sphinx dates back to the Old Kingdom. However, my mentor, the late great rogue Egyptologist and symbolist author, John Anthony West, was of another opinion. Inspired by the works of French hermeticist, occultist, alchemist, R.A. Chouelet de Lubitsch, who came here to Egypt and studied what we refer to as the sacred science of the ancient Egyptians. 15 years, mostly spending his time where I live in Luxor, on the Luxor Temple, which by the way, I have a book coming out, the Esoteric Symbolist Guidebook to the Luxor Temple of Man, which will be available in a couple of months. But uh, he spent most of his time there, but he came here as well. And he observed aquatic water erosion on the Sphinx. So there are some documents that contradict the currently cherished paradigm in Egyptology for the dating. We have what's known as the Palermo Stone and the Turin Papyrus, uh, both appropriately named because they're housed in Turin and um, and uh, Turin and what did I say? The Palermo. Oh, Palermo. Early in the morning, still need a cup of coffee. Yeah, so Palermo Stone and Turin Papyrus are fragmentary documents. The Palermo Stone is the remains of a stela, which is what we have here, one of these stone monuments, and. Um, they're fragmentary texts, but when put back together, Schwala was able to establish that the dates loosely correspond to 30,000, 35,000 years before. So this is the ancient, Egyptian, ancient Egyptians themselves telling us about a prehistory. The history we know that's established in academia, uh, the ancient Egyptian civilization begins with the unification of the two lands by Namr came from the south. The two lands are Upper and Lower Egypt. Uh, although currently in Egyptology there's new ideas that two lands could also represent the east and the west side of the Nile. And from an esoteric point of view, land essentially is a plane, a plane of existence. So it can also mean the inner and outer. As within, so without. As above, so below. And so, um, we know the Egyptian civilization, according to academia, starts with the unification of the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt. And this gets a little confusing. Upper Egypt is actually the south, where I live, in Luxor. And Lower Egypt is here and further to the north in the delta as we get closer to the Mediterranean. Why? Because for the ancient Egyptians, their ontology, their worldview, and their mythology, their creation, their beginning, started with a primordial mound that rose from the watery chaos. And so as we go further south, you're actually going up that mound, back toward creation. It is there, and we will visit Aswan and the cataract. It is there from which the Nile flows all the way out into the Mediterranean. So it, it flows down. It's the, only, it's the only Nile River in the world that is flowing from the south to the north, but that's considered Upper Egypt. So the unification of these two lands by Namr establishes Egyptian civilization, although there's textual evidence to suggest that there were previous unifications. And as I mentioned, the Palermo Stone and the Turin Papyrus reference older periods of time. The Egyptologists tell us this is just purely mythological. However, some of the are of the opinion that the ancient Egyptians were making an account for their history. On these stones, we have regnal years of the rulers. It goes all the way back to a time of when the divine walked the earth, or was at one with, with the sphere that we're in now. And then there was another, it was a long period of time that elapsed. And then there was another period where we had what are called the followers of Horus, or the Shemsu Hor. And we take this to be semi-realized beings. We'll talk about the definition of realized 
uh, as it corresponds to enlightenment as we go along throughout this esoteric tour of Egypt. And so, you know, there's a lot of question whether those documents are real or if, if they actually account for pure history, true history, or if they're mythological. In any event, that's historical documentation. Schwalid Lubitz made a, a very long account in some of his later work um, referring to a lot of these old ideas that, that civilization predates the Egyptian civilization. He used a lot of accounts from antiquity, mostly Roman and, and Gre Greco-Roman Greek accounts referencing older epochs. And so at the end of a chapter in his work, there's just one single line that references water erosion on the Sphinx. And whether Schwaller actually understood the implications of this or not, or never really commented on it, so we don't know. So it was my mentor, and Sahila's as well, the late great John Anthony West that realized the importance of this because this isn't just historical documentation, which in a court of law would be hearsay. We don't know unless we were there. You know, it's, it's in a sense circumstantial evidence. But if there's water erosion on the Sphinx, that would mean this is geology. And geology is science, and science can be tested. So what we're gonna to do today is take you around the Sphinx enclosure and talk about the geology of the Sphinx. And we're gonna provide you again with the standard academic Egyptological point of view, as well as the alternative ideas and the many opposing contradictory theories. It's not my job to impose a particular point of view on you, as I mentioned last night during the orientation, what we're going to do is present the evidence. We're going to put all the pieces on the table for you and allow you to be judge and jury and decide for yourselves. Ultimately, truth isn't necessarily what the academic Egyptological point of view is. Truth isn't necessarily what we find on the alternative side. Just because it's green doesn't mean that it's good. There's a lot of people that want to sell you books and tours and will stretch the truth. So ultimately, the objective truth is really the only truth and it's very hard for humans to uh, challenging for humans to fathom this but esoteric tradition tells us that that truth comes from within we talked a little bit last night about the meaning of the word esoteric this is an ancient histories and mysteries esoteric tour of egypt the word esoteric again if you were to look it up in the dictionary today the modern definition is that which is intended for a select few and we often think of secret societies the rosicrucians the freemasons and these organizations that preserve universal eternal principles which are often rooted in indigenous traditions and, and ancient civilizations seem to share the same mindset uh, but the word esoteric actually comes from the greek iso which means inner so again esoteric is about the inner aspect of things and as we mentioned last night the difference between religion and mysticism is that with religion we're looking without for answers we're going through an intermediary for answers or, or connection to the divine whereas with mysticism we're going within with that said i'd like to ask you to now shift your attention within suspend your beliefs for a moment and approach with an open mind yes sahila Instead of the classical uh, date in 2640 BC, that's Old Kingdom for dynasty, this could go back to 7,000 BC. 10,000, that's the cautious date. Because if we look uh, in another way, the earth and the weather huh, has been different totally 30,000 years BC and older or so that average of, uh, of of all those calculated years will shift to the civilization from as uh, as next told you is it the upper and lower egypt uh, unification was it really 3200 bc when egypt civilization started then this follows or was there a civilization that had been way before right. So, so our mentor, John Anthony West, was of the opinion that Egypt 
is actually a legacy civilization because it just appears advanced out of nowhere. You have these giant monumental structures, megalithic building, religion, symbolism, all of these ideas just seem to appear without much development. So he's of the opinion that Egypt is the product of a legacy civilization and this was met with much resistance from academia who tells us that it starts at this particular time. John was of the opinion uh, at first that this could have been from Nile flooding. The idea that there's water erosion on the Sphinx is geology, it can be tested. He brought this to a museum curator and basically brought them a, an image that was duct taped up and he revealed one of the pieces of tape and he showed it to the curator and he said, what does this look like to you? And he said, well, it looks like water erosion. Then he peeled away the top level and it was the side profile of the Sphinx and the curator's jaw what? dropped. <laughs> so then he went, he was still met with resistance. They erected a common wall of silence around this until eventually he met Dr. Robert Schock, a Boston, a geologist that teaches at Boston, was teaching at uh, Boston University, Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm from the States, hence the accent, Park Khan, Harvard Yard. I don't pronounce my R's in case you haven't noticed. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so Dr. Schock was able to give John the credentials, in a sense, to, to give his theory some validity because Schock had the credentials. John didn't. John was a satirical writer, a copywriter, an author, but he didn't have the academic background that was necessary to really get this idea out, where Schock had studied at university at Yale, and he was a geologist, studied paleontology, uh, and so forth. And so when they came here to the Sphinx in the early 1990s, they, they tested one of the first things when Shaw came through the uh, enclosure, he noticed not so much the water erosion on the Sphinx, everyone was in awe, you know, spellbound by the Sphinx and looking at the Sphinx. But Shock, as a geologist, was looking at the stone and he was looking at the enclosure walls. And he told John off record, this looks very, very old. John retells a story that it could have been thousands of years. For John, it could be much older, dating back to 30,000 BC. The reason for this, again, is the Palermo stone and the term papyrus reference periods that add up to about 30 to 34,000 BC, which corresponds loosely to the zodiacal procession of the equinoxes. Okay, so there are other alternative ideas posited by authors such as Graham Hancock and Robert Bavall that the Sphinx is attributed to Leo. It would be looking at its image in the sky some 10,000 years ago. So they think that the Sphinx may go as far back as that time, that it was consecrated to that principle. However, if you go back another processional cycle, that would bring us loosely around that 30,000 year time frame. And so John was always of the opinion it must be much older. But Shock, as Sahila mentioned, was very cautious. He was up for tenor and it would be, you know, insane for him to come out and say that the Sphinx is 30,000 years old publicly. And the dating that he had uh, based on his analysis of the Sphinx, which we'll take you through and show you the evidence, suggested an older date for the Sphinx going back in between uh, like six, 7,000 years. Over time, Shock has actually pushed that back even further. He now says it could be, it could go back as far, you know, some 10 to 10,000. The Sphinx geology is very complex. If you come over here for a moment, we'll just give you a crash course, Sphinx geology 101. So to really understand this, number one, the Sphinx is not your great granddaddy's Sphinx. It's had many restoration periods over time. We'll discuss it as we walk around. And the geology isn't just one surface. You actually have three separate levels of rock strata, which the uh, geologists here refer to as uh, the upper, I'm sorry, member one, member two, and member three, which can get confusing because you may not know if you're gonna label the top number one or the bottom number one. So Shock uses a different convention. He refers to it as the lower, middle, and upper, and that's what we'll use today. So in other words, if you look over here at this bed of limestone, the Mokatam rock formation, it actually dips under the, it goes through the pores and dips to the other side, which I'll show you in a minute. That is the lower member. The Sphinx geology is like a layer cake. That's the lower member. And then in the back, we see uh, the ridge and all through the body, that's the second member. And then up above is the head, which is the hardest. So it has alternating levels of soft and hard levels of limestone. The head being the hardest, which has been subject to the most erosion because the Sphinx has been buried under the sand numerous times throughout history. So again, we have three separate levels. And if we come over here, yes. Are you saying that like before the Sphinx was here, this, what I see right here, 
would have been one surface that joined up with, with what I see over here. Correct. And then likewise, that in, would have been one. In surface. fact, not this level, but the second level back uh -huh. there, likely what happened here, likely, and uh, Farouk El Baz, Egyptian geologist, would say that it was a yardang. Shock says it's not a yardang. A yardang is a formation that the outcropping of the rock. Essentially, to keep it simple, what we would have seen originally is up to the neck in the Sphinx would have all been the land, the, the Mokadam rock formation, and the head would have just been this massive outcropping. Mm -hmm. So someone came along and fashioned the face. We'll get into that in a minute. They had to excavate this. Right. They would have they would have taken or excavated all the stone out of here. Yeah. And where did they put that stone? Built all right here. That's all of this. Right. So the head is a bit of a mystery. We'll talk about that too when and we walk around. Stuff. Yes. No, no, no. The head is natural. Oh. So you have the land mass and then you have this outcropping. Yeah. So someone came along. The Egyptologists will tell us, well, then they fashioned the head of Khafra during the time of Khafra. There's alternative ideas, which we'll talk about as we walk around the Sphinx, that it was originally the head of a lion. It was much bigger. The reason for that is because when you look at it, we'll see it from the side profile. The head is disproportionate to the body. And I'll explain why and provide you with different theories. But if we come over here, I'm going to show you where the geology is. So right here you're going to notice a channel. Right this way everyone. We're now going to proceed to walk around the Sphinx. And you'll all have the opportunity again to get pictures in the light right before we leave. So this channel right here, this is this is where that first lower member dips under the plateau. So it actually, it's not on even ground. Is it? it actually, it's on a tilt. It dips from the west to the east and from north to south, kind of on an angle like this. The, the levels of geology, different levels of rock strata. And so that, that, that first lower level comes right through the and dips under here and then all of this was part of the second level which mostly is the body is mostly comprised of and this ridge right here we see this is all member two the middle member and then we have the upper member the head so if we walk over here we're going to now take a look at the sphinx enclosure wall and this is where the evidence is for the water erosion. So the idea that the Sphinx is weathered by water or according to Robert Schock that the enclosure is weathered, what does this tell us? That we would have had to have seen significant amounts of rainfall, but Egypt doesn't see all that much rain. It gets a little bit. And then there were these periods, the Nappian fluvials where we received some rain. But the idea for the alternative camp is that, you know, we haven't seen this much rainfall since the end of the last ice age. Uh, and so that's, the, the, some believe that the Sphinx predates that and goes much further back into antiquity. Shock kept it conservative and said, no, it isn't 2400 BC as an old kingdom. It could be you know, thousands of years older. Based on the idea that we see water erosion patterns on the enclosure itself. Here, this actually get the best view from over here. So this means it's not Nile floods. flooding but based on what we're going to see shock determined that it's not Nile flooding that it is actually water precipitation induced water runoff rainfall stick would have come through notice on the Sphinx here we have uh, well if we look over here on the enclosure wall you have this almost candle wax like effect you see that horizontally how you have the different, the ridge, kind of this undulating profile. Look over here on the Sphinx, where do you notice that? Up above, we have, there's three levels. Does, does everyone see that? It's very similar. So, if you look just behind the neck of the Sphinx on that first level, there's a, a vertical line. That is not water erosion. That's just a natural fish.
finisher in, in the bedroom. What you see here, the undulating profile, that's precipitation-induced water runoff. In other words, water would have ran on the back of the Sphinx and traveled over the side, forming that pattern that we see. Similar here. We also have the vertical fissures, which is controversial because some say that it is related to the rainfall. Others say it could have already been there. Um, this here is actually some confuses. If you watch YouTube videos, this is not water erosion. This is a giant fissure. There, as you can see, they're covering up the evidence here. This wasn't always here. They recently put this up in the last few years, likely part of restoration. Although I don't understand how this qualifies as restoration, but. This would have been a massive fissure. There's old photos of John Anthony West inside, deep inside here. All right, that's all blocked off and concealed now. This is contrary to popular belief in alternative circles. This is not water erosion. This is a natural defect. It's called the Great Fissure, and it runs right through the floor here, right through the ground, and through the back of the Sphinx onto the other side. And it actually gives us the shape of the Sphinx. This is why what we may see is disproportionate. Again, take a look at the body. It's best viewed from the other side when we go over there, but look at the body compared to the head. The head appears to be too small. The head is smaller than it should be given the proportions of the body. We'll talk about why, there's a few theories uh, on the other side. But this whole, uh, in fact, Dr. Robert Schock and Dr. Manu Saves today wrote a paper about how this line, they go through the back of the rump the rump itself is actually the symbol for Heka, Heka magic. And so they believe that this fracture may have inspired the glyph, the symbol for Heka, um, which means that the Sphinx would have been here much earlier than academics tell us. These things on the side that you'll notice, and if you like, you can go peek inside the little hole here if you want and stick your cameras in there if you're that enthused. But these are called uh, surdabs, which is basically like Arabic for cella and they would have had statues. There would have also been a statue in front of the Sphinx, a statue of Osiris and Osirian pose, and a royal beard. On the side of the face, when we're up above on a plateau later looking in, you'll notice there's a square on the side of the Sphinx's face. Some have postulated, posited the idea this may be a secret entrance. That's not the case. It's just the attachment where the beard would have went, and then there would have been a statue below. The archeologist and Egyptologist Mark Lehner has done a re recreation of it. at again is multiple layers of restoration. You have Old Kingdom stone, New Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, Greco-Roman, the Greeks, the Romans, and even modern restoration, even the paws. The paws were extended over time. It's believed that the Romans further extended the paws. And then what you see now are all modern bricks. The bricks that are wrapped around the Sphinx paws, they're not ancient. Again, it's not your great granddaddy Sphinx. It's had multiple restorations, it's very complex. However, archeologist and Egyptologist Mark Lehner, who by the way, how many people here are familiar with Edgar Cayce? Raise your hands. Edgar Cayce, the great American sleeping prophet, uh, who is, we're, how many people here are familiar with what's called the Hall of Records? Raise your hands. Okay, it's believed that there's a Hall of Records beneath the paws of the Sphinx. Most people know about this or get this idea from Edgar Cayce who popularized it. Um, Edgar Cayce, again, was a great American sleeping prophet that during his sleep and, and uh, he'd go into a trance-like state, he'd go into a trance-like state and he would, would report to someone, they would document all the information and he would give these prophecies. In full disclosure, many of them are not all that accurate. Even the people at his ARE, uh, Enlightenment for, Enlightenment, A-R-E, Enlightenment Research, I'm botching it up. Anyway, he has an organization in Virginia. Um, and so, but some of Edgar Cayce's stuff is really interesting. Some of his prophecies, you know, and ideas have, are reasonable to conjecture. One is this idea of what's beneath the Sphinx. Is this where we really learn about, is this where we first get the information about this Hall of Records from Edgar Cayce? No. This actually predates Edgar Cayce. It's a concept that has long been known in esoteric circles where you have proprietary information that doesn't make its way out into the masses because people swear oaths and, and preserve ancient universal principles. And so author Hugh Clayton Randall Stevens 
years before Edgar Cayce wrote not about the hall of records beneath the Sphinx, which is said to have, you know, everybody puts their own ideas to it, great knowledge, who knows what's under there. But Edgar Cayce is the one who popularized it. Hugh Clayton Randall Stevens told us that there was a hall of mysteries beneath the paws of the Sphinx, years before Edgar Cayce. Further, the first imperator of the Rosicrucian order, Amor. Everybody familiar with the Rosicrucians somewhat, maybe? They're an esoteric organization. First imperator of the Rosicrucian order, Amor, Harvey Spencer Lewis, wrote a phenomenal book called The Symbolic Prophecy of the Sphinx. In that book, he included an illustration of what's beneath the Sphinx, a temple and an entrance into the Sphinx. Um, and he tells us that they get it from Rosicrucian manuscripts. The Rosicrucians, by the way, were really the first leading pilgrims and travelers here to the, the Sphinx in Egypt on spiritual trips. They would do initiate, they still do initiations inside the Great Pyramid to this day. But they were among the first that were leading these groups that have ideas that are not necessarily aligned with standard academic point of view. And so they've been coming here for a long time and they have their manuscripts. Harvey Spencer Lewis says this information comes from a Rosicrucian manuscript. Hugh Clayton Randall Stevens has an association with another esoteric organization known as the Knights Templar of Aquarius. And he has also an illustration which he says came to him through channeling. And so I'll leave that open for you. Uh, you know, it's, it's very challenging to contest another person's personal experience. So you can't really, you know, who's to say what's BS and what's not. Uh, we will talk about Dorothy Eady and Om Seti when we get to Abydos, who I feel was very much connected with these sort of things. However, my personal view is that a lot of channeling, I think, gets stretched a bit. People get wrapped up in the concept. Um, it's not uncommon for people to come on our tours that are Akhenaten or Hatshepsut in a previous life. The problem is they often know very little about that previous life. And it's never, you know, the driver or the maid. It's always some major historical figure. But <laughs> anyway, so, um, so Hugh Clayton Randall Stevens and Harvey Spencer Lewis both published documentation before Edgar Cayce. Everybody wants to attribute the Hall of Records to Edgar Cayce. It's very likely. We know for a fact from my own research at his organization in Virginia, on file, he has a record of having Rosicrucians as clients. Therefore, we know he was aware of the Rosicrucian Order Amor, which is, uh, some referred to it back then as mail order mysticism because they would mail out the monographs. And so it's likely, it's reasonable to conjecture that, that Edgar Cayce may have received the information from the Rosicrucians or been, a, been part of some esoteric circles that may have heard about this or seen the published material and repeated it. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. But what I can tell you is that this idea of a Hall of Records goes back before him. And it goes back even further into antiquity because in the Leiden Museum we have a, a magical scroll which tells us Jehuti. Tahuti, which then becomes known as Toth to the Greeks, or Toth, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, tells us that there is a secret beneath the feet of Horemachit. And what did I say one of the names of the Sphinx was? Horemachit. One of the names. And so, and we'll talk about that more as we go around to the other side. So, again, there's a lot of ideas. We'll also talk about the potential for these cavities beneath the ground. Um, one of the observations that Dr. Robert Schock made, aside from the water erosion, so again, natural fracture, fracture, water erosion, the undulating profile, water erosion, and one of the other key, Schock actually made two key observations. Most people know him for being famous, along with John Anthony West, who opened the door for Schock, and then other alternative researchers like Graham Hancock, Robert Bavall, and a whole plethora of alternative historians. Really, we have John Anthony West to thank for challenging science and academia. But Schock actually observed two things, not just the water erosion. That's what everybody knows him for, the water erosion theory. Schock also did an experiment called seismic refraction, which is considered pseudoscience in academia for a lot of people. However, they even use it here in Egypt. Halloween University uses it to determine cavities beneath the ground. It's, it's actual science. And so Shaw came here in the 90s with Thomas de Becke, a, a geophysicist. They had state-of-the-art equipment. And essentially what this is, is they test, the, they test for cavities beneath the surface by cutting the stone. Once the stone, so remember we talked about how all the stone came out of the enclosure. Once you cut the surface of the stone, it's exposed to air. Once it becomes exposed to air, it automatically begins to decay. 
and it decays over long periods of time. It's called exponential kinetics. And it, you know, it, it goes on for a long time. From that, we can determine an age, or this is what Schock and Dobecki used to determine an age. So they set up lines, refraction lines, all around the Sphinx. In the back, they determined that it was about a meter in depth. On the sides, it was about two and a half meters. And in the front, it was about three to three and a half meters. And so from that depth, they were able to establish an age. One of the things that few alternative historians talk about is that from these results, that it really can't be older than 10,000 BC. My mentor is of the opinion that the Sphinx goes back to 30,000 BC. Admittedly, there was a period that I, I think it's, I think that these ideas of the Egyptians are possible because they're talking about this older period of time, although it could be allegorical, it could be cosmology, it could be something more to that. But based on the scientific results of the seismic refraction experiment, it cannot be older than 10,000 BC. Yes, Sahila? how weather worked uh, and we've seen a movie uh, you know a documentary showing you that so you'll find that the whole earth was was full up full up with with a lot of rain much much rain and it was like floods of rain you know so this was the time and that was about 30,000 BC or a little less that affected this water has affected the body of the Sphinx. So the Sphinx ten, was preceded, you know, and the front of the, look, look at the paw. The paw, you will see the very um, uh, systematic kind of uh, stones stuck on them to, to restore it. That's the modern. All right, just look up uh, above the elbow. Do you see the better stones compared then versus the, the body? the body the core look how much it has lost this has been the, 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 you know as far it, the, the body of the sphinx was that thicker it has lost this much and this is not le not less than this much of stone how much stone and this is very hard stone not uh, not a cartoon or paper to lose this ero you know erosion how much in how many years and here we see many um, kingdoms, we call them kingdoms of history, old, middle, new kingdom. Some of the blocks here date from the old kingdom. So if this sphinx, if the sphinx, if the statue was made in the old kingdom as they presume or they believe, how much of it has been lost in erosion? And why should I? a restore and add blocks to restore it in the same period of time. This takes many, many more years than a hundred or two hundred or five hundred years, you know, of, of erosion. So, yeah. so the stones themselves, and, and uh, Mark Lehner is the foremost authority on the Sphinx. Uh, and this is my point about Edgar Casey because he actually comes from that school of thought. Uh, his parents were, uh, they, they were students basically of Edgar Casey, And so Mark Lehner, they funded his, uh, the, the ARE research, Casey's organization, funded him to come to Egypt. He's already an archeologist, funded him to become an Egyptologist, to study the Sphinx, to get to the secrets, to find out if there's a hall of records beneath the Sphinx. And in the process, he actually converted to standard academia and basically says, there's nothing, there's no secrets. I've, I've, this was his office. He worked here every day between the paws of the Sphinx. He would come in with his cup of coffee and he surveyed the Sphinx stone by stone. You can go on the internet. If anyone's really interested, um, I can send it to you in the WhatsApp group, if you like, where we have uh, the survey of each stone indicating which is New Kingdom, which is Old Kingdom. Typically, what we see is the older, bigger blocks, which we'll see some in the back, especially as we go up and around stuff like you see there the older the the bigger blocks are usually the oldest that's what we find in the old kingdom and then over time people are working with smaller blocks all the way up to modern day where you know we have these little bricks for the floors so if we come over here you'll also notice this is one of the pieces of evidence that the egyptologists use to say the sphinx couldn't have been here earlier because this is what's known as the causeway, the Khafre causeway. Mark <laughs> Lehner, by the way, tells us that the face of the Sphinx is Khafre. And uh, he did a computer analysis in the 90s 
maybe it was late 80s, early 90s, did a computer analysis. At that time, technology wasn't all that advanced, but he basically just superimposed, he took a statue from uh, the Boston Museum, uh, an image of the face of Kafra on the statue and superimposed it over the face of the Sphinx, and lo and behold, they matched up. But you could pretty much take any face. John and Anthony West would often joke you could take the face of Elvis and put it on there. And, you would, and it would line up. Um, but they tell us, so, so we know this is the causeway here, this connects to the Pyramid of Khafra, and so there's some pieces of evidence that the Egyptologists used to say it's Khafra. Um, however, Egyptologist Salim Hassan, who worked here in the early 20th century, himself documented how all these pieces of evidence are still circumstantial. This is not conclusive. The jury is still out. One of those pieces is just the fact that it's it's in the proximity of the pyramid which has been assigned to Khafra, and this is the Khafra Causeway. And so there's this, uh, this opening here, this cavity where water would have come in, and so the Egyptologists tell us the Sphinx would not have been here before the causeway. The Sphinx had to have been fashioned after they made the pyramid and thus the causeway, because if water would have run in here, that wouldn't have been good for the Egyptians. It would have eroded their precious Sphinx. For the Egyptologists, they have uh, what is called the, well, it's several theories. The currently cherished paradigm is what's known as the salt crystallization theory. It's spalling, which is essentially, below us is the water table. So even if there is a hall of records, it's completely submerged in water by now. The water table is rising. Uh, and so what happens is through capillary action, the water comes up through the porous limestone and it basically goes through the capillaries of the limestone and it causes it to flake. So if you come over here, you'll see, like this is a good example of it right here. You can come in and take a look at this. You can see how the limestone is, is sort of flaky here. I don't really want to deteriorate this much more, but it's inevitable. So John Anthony West would call these laner flakes because laner was the opposition for John West. Really flaky material. This is from the water eroding from the inside out. So they're saying, at first they were saying it's all wind and sand erosion you see on the Sphinx. Shock says no, there's some water erosion and mainly water erosion on the enclosure. Uh, he's, he's been met with opposition. There's other geologists that completely disagree with Shock. Many different alternative theories when it comes to the geology of the Sphinx not to confuse you anymore. But now we're gonna walk around to the back and as Sahila was saying, the, the, the bigger stones are the oldest. This becomes very important because we're gonna talk about a very important piece of geological evidence right now. And the color, the darker, the older. Hmm. I mean, you can see a classic example of the difference of, of stone here. We have the modern restoration filling in the patches. We have some of the oldest stone here as you walk around, and then there's some of the bigger Old Kingdom stones in the back. Right this way, everyone. So this channel, this path that we're walking through now, uh, Dr. Robert Schock and Thomas Dobeke established it. This, this was about a, a meter down. And, this, and the Egyptologists will agree with this. They think that this was carved out around the time of Khafra, this part. And we can see how it even, uh, the, the workmen that were here during the time of Khafra were fashioning the wall. It almost goes to a 90 degree angle, but it stopped. We don't know why. I mean, maybe Khafra transitioned into the afterlife or workmen went on strike, who knows? But the fact of the matter is, we know that they were working carving out this area based on the seismic refraction experiment. He was able to determine it's about a meter below. And so because it's only a meter, based on what they established in the front and the sides where I said it's about two and a half meters and then three and a half meters, which gives us about six to 7,000 years or more, this would have been around the time of Khafra that they fashioned this part. So they, and we'll see it better from the side, so they think that this was this part was done during Khafra, but the front would have been much older. When we go out on a plateau later, we'll see some of the larger stones, but you can see the juxtaposition of some of the bigger stones on top and then newer stones and modern restoration on bottom. This here is what I like to call the sphincter of the sphinx. This is the rear, the bum, the back end. 
Uh, this has a very interesting story. When Mark Lehner was here doing his very impressive, to, to give credit where credit is due, uh, Mark Lehner did his very impressive survey of the Sphinx. They were almost done doing everything, and this was all blocked up at the time. It required a local man from the village. Across from the Sphinx over here, we have Nazad el Samam. And in the uh, early 20th century, there was an early uh, Egyptologist here, Emil Gueres, who did one of the early excavations, restorations on the Sphinx. Actually used a lot of cement to seal, seal stuff up, which wasn't good. But he had, they employed a lot of the local workers, the local village men. They would carry baskets on their head back and forth with sand, and they'd bring bread and food for the workers. Anyway, it was uh, in the 90s when Mark Lehner was doing his survey, and one of the local men explained how there used to be a passage leading into the Sphinx as a hidden entrance. Okay, And so the Egyptologist gave him the benefit of the doubt. I believe it was actually the man's father that had worked on, on the work during the Emil Beres excavation in the early 1900s. And he remembered that if you move a stone here, there should be a passage. So they told Egypt, how they, he walked up, he knew exactly where it was. He pointed right to it and was like, here, if you move this stone, you'll find a passage. Sure enough, the Egyptologists removed it and they found it. If you were to go inside here, it leads into a bifurcated shaft. Bifurcated, it splits into two. It goes, it goes around this way a little bit over here, and then it goes up and into the rump and around. And in this bifurcated shaft on the upper shelf is a very important piece of geological evidence because it is there that we find an old kingdom stone against the second level of rock strata of, of the geology. And so at first, Dr. Zahi Hawass, everybody familiar with Zahi? The good friend Zahi. Uh, Zahi Hawass was the head of the Ministry of Antiquities for many years, famous, the in Egyptian Indiana Jones did all the films and documentaries with everyone throughout the years. And he was the opposition for my mentor, John Anthony West. Zahi represented the, the traditional uh, the Orthodox Egyptology. Um, anyway, so, and I'm actually gonna be in a film uh, with Zahi in uh, November on Amazon. It's an exclusive Amazon documentary. Uh, anybody here familiar with Ruud Gillet? How do you pronounce it, Kaylee? <laughs> Ruud Gillet. Anybody familiar with Ruud Gillet? He's a, a football He's a footballer. Player, yes. For you Americans, that's soccer player. Yeah. Um, he's a famous soccer player for our European friends, footballer. He, he's a phenomenal world athlete in the 90s. I mean, he, he was incredible. He's from Kaylee's country. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kaylee could probably speak a bit more about how, how impressive he is and how well, you guys revere him. Back in uh, 1988, we had the European Championships of soccer. And he and the team won for the very first time. It's the only time that the Netherlands won a championship. And therefore, the entire team is revered as the golden era of football when it comes to the Netherlands. So he's, in our minds, one of the greatest football players ever lived. So, and yeah. Egyptians love their football. If you ask pretty much any Egyptian, they're going to know who he is. Anyway, he also has a penchant for exploring the ancient mysteries and, uh, and Egypt. And so he came here on a quest to look into some of the mysteries and began filming a documentary series. His producers reached out to me to provide the counter narrative to Zahi Hawass because in the program he has Zahi. So in the, and he has some really big names, Eric Van Doniken, uh, really big names in the series. But in the series finale, it's basically me versus Zahi with Rude here <laughs> over the Sphinx. I don't want to spoil it for you, but we reveal some very important information. Zahi says no more secrets. I basically say a lot of the stuff I'm telling you now and more. Uh, so this leads to a bifurcated shaft inside. Zahi tells us that there was um, that it was um, an old kingdom repair stone. Okay, the inside the upper level that there was a stone and it was part of an old kingdom repair. And when was the Sphinx first fashioned? In the old kingdom. So as Sahila was mentioning earlier, why would you have restoration? Why would you have a repair to something you just fashioned? Later, Mark Lehner came along and said, well, this is actually, uh, this was done in the new kingdom, but they're using old kingdom stone. It's sort of Sir Clewis thinking. The, but the thing we have to question here really though is why you're using an old kingdom stone part of uh, on a structure that was apparently just built which would suggest that the sphinx is older than what the egyptologists tell us but again they're saying because of this channel right here water would have come in and we wouldn't have had that other
other, we'll walk this way, walk and talk. Uh, other alternative historians, such as Robert Temple, has a book, The Sphinx Mystery. He believes that this was a moat, that this was all water, and that the head was not originally the head of a man, but the head of Anubis, which would have been bigger, which would explain how the body is disproportionate to the head. However, uh, world award-winning sculptor Robert Nalen recreated the Sphinx with clay with his hands and determined that the back of the head is, is definitely too small and that it couldn't have been the head of Anubis because the nose would have broke off. They believe it was the head of a, not a lion. Originally, Dr. Robert Schock believed this, that it was lined up with Leo, so he thought it was Leo. But over time, more recent research, a glyphic uh, script has determined, Dr. Manu Seifzadeh has determined that the Sphinx may be Mahit, an ancient lioness, and so that the head may have been the head of not a man, but a female lioness. And over time, the face was refashioned. So this part of the Sphinx over here, this is this line that you're looking at, this is part of that fissure on the other side. I said there's a natural defect that runs through the back of the Sphinx onto the other side. That forms the rump, what's known as the rump of the Sphinx, right here from the back. So what was probably here, and even the Egyptologists agree with this, is that this part was the last to be carved out. This would have all been stone, and the Sphinx would have been coming, and this is, ties right into the symbolism, formless, formlessness coming into form, spirit manifesting as matter, which we'll talk about a lot during this trip, which is an intensive study tour. We're gonna overwhelm you with information. Don't worry about it. You'll, a lot of this will be recurring themes. By the end of the tour, you'll all be trained up experts and be able to go back home and spread the word. But so here, you would have just had this part of the head, then they fashioned this part of the body, and then eventually they wanted to form, form the rump. That's the Egyptological point of view. That's why they say it's disproportionate. The alternative camp will tell us it's disproportionate because originally it would have been a much bigger head of a lioness. <laughs> when Robert Nealon was carving the Sphinx, he noticed that the space in the back, the, the back of the pharaoh's headdress, it's called a nemes headdress. It has a counterpoise in the back. It's missing, it broke, but there should have been more there. But it should have been bigger overall, so it would have been the face of a lioness. I can send you a, a, re a recreation of the photo of what that would have looked like. And also, Egyptians do not do stages for such a thing. I personally do not believe it. According to what we studied in their ideas and beliefs, even their beliefs can do a half thing, no way. Why could it not be a moat? Uh, it's a good question. Why not? Uh, for the Egyptologists, it's because it would have deteriorated the Sphinx. But it was there before. Uh, it depends what theory. We're going to move from this because we got to cover the other stuff silo, but there's many alternative theories. Robert Temple says that this was a moat and it, it was actually originally Anubis. This is based on the pyramid text that we'll see inside the Pyramid of Unis when we go to Saqqara tomorrow. Uh, it refers to the jackal. The jackal is a guardian and a moat. And so he's attributing that moat to this area. It also references Rastau, which was an ancient name for this area. Rastau essentially means necropolis, specifically this one here. Uh, you can get the book Sphinx Mystery by Robert Temple, which explains that theory. Um, so in my doc, and I talk a bit more about, actually I give you the whole comprehensive view. It's about an hour long, my documentary on YouTube, which is great. I do have a YouTube channel, by the way, if you're not familiar, like, subscribe, and click the bell icon for more. Uh, in the documentary, Sphinx Explain, uh, Hidden Origins, Identity, and, and uh, Origins, Identity, and Hidden Entrances, I talk about different various entrances into the Sphinx. So top of the head has a hole. We can see some photos, uh, vintage photos of a man up to his neck. It's about six feet or so. Although Egyptologist Emil Beret is sealed inside with cement. So we really don't know how much further it went down. There's some speculation. There was an image that came out that goes further down and there's a hidden temple inside the Sphinx complete with hieroglyphs. That's been debunked. That was just a, a sensationalized newspaper that came out in Australia some years back. The hole was very likely used to affix a headdress. When we go to the Luxor Museum, I'm going to show you a statue of a sphinx. It's almost like a Lego piece where the headdress pops inside. Um, and so there's that. Behind the neck, there's another hole. That's because uh, Howard Weiss 
and his colleagues. They were trying to burrow their way into the Sphinx, just like many in antiquity. They're curious to find stuff and they were going inside and they actually got the drill bit stuck inside. It wasn't until the 1990s that Zahi Huas came along and, and removed the drill bit. In the back where the fissure is, there is a deep opening that goes down. That line that cuts through the rump of the Sphinx is actually a cavity that goes all the way down. Uh, there's accounts from antiquity that tell us that there was a pharaoh buried in there, all sort of different ideas. There used to be uh, priests that would go in there and do oracles and pretend to be the Sphinx, um, giving messages to people that would come here from that cavity, which connects around to the back. However, it's been filled up with cement by Emil Bereis during that early uh, restoration period. And so we really can't say how far that goes down. And so there, there's that one. And then of course we went over the rump and then there's this. Feast your eyes upon this. This here, you can see the difference. There's a photo, a vintage photo that uh, has circulated, you can find on the internet. Again, I can send you this stuff later if you're interested. Where we see people inside here during early restoration periods. So there's some depth and width to this. Um, there's also a video, I talk about this in the documentary, where Zahi Hawass tells everyone that they found the photos, they know there was an opening into the Sphinx here, but he says that uh, it goes nowhere. I have a problem with this language. There's nothing written about it or recorded, even though they were in there and they sealed it back. Ian Zahi admits, or at least he says one time that he went back in, but we don't have any documentation. Now it does take time in academia. They have to be very meticulous and slow to write their papers, but we have no documentation of height, width, dimensions inside. So, they'll tell us it goes nowhere, it's nothing. I have a problem with that because even your closet, if you open a closet, it goes somewhere. It has a height, width, depth, and we don't know enough about this, how far it goes. Further, who's to say that there isn't a stone inside that somebody missed? You know, no single set of eyes can see it all. Who's to say there's not a stone inside that just like the rump, if we remove, goes somewhere else? We don't know, we can't say with certainty, and now, unfortunately, it's all concealed. If we come over here, what time is this, Sahara? Uh, 6.25. Oh, we got good time. Yeah, we're going to get that. We got good time. You may have noticed as we're walking along, you have some of these, uh, these things over here. The car holes. There's another one right here covered up. Come look at this. Very important piece of evidence here, guys. Put this stone back but this is where they did drilling they they took core samples from beneath the surface according to edgar casey the hall of records would have been beneath the paws of the sphinx that's always been the big controversy and specifically uh the seismic refraction survey that dr robert shock did reveals several cavities there's been some other experiments before him that also revealed cavities but they found a new one and where they found it, so this is where the, the Egyptologists drilled. And this is what Zahi Was, Mark Lane will say, we've drilled around the Sphinx, there's nothing. There's nothing below, these are all American hallucinations. However, what the seismic refraction survey showed is starting from about here and going about 12 meters this way <laughs> and nine meters this way is a cavity beneath the surface of the left paw. Paw in my Boston accent. It's, it's beneath the surface. And so what he also observed is sharp right angles. Nature does not produce sharp right angles. So what does that tell us? Hall of Records. <laughs> I believe it. I leave that up for you guys. I'm not going to say I, I totally subscribe to the idea of the Hall of Records anymore. But what I will say is that according to Shock's observation, and his word and his experiment that there's a right angle inside which it would only have to be man-made nature doesn't produce exact sharp right angles in that way so the egyptologists archaeologists say nope nothing under the sphinx we've checked the core samples but they missed it this is a wide margin because the seismic refraction survey started from here went 12 meters out nine meters across this was the last line of core sampling. So they missed it. So in the documentary that I'm in with Zahi Hawass that's coming out in November, we talk about this and I talk about the wide, you know, the wide arrow. Now, to the benefit, uh, or in the interest of fairness, 
why do the Egyptologists think this is in the Old Kingdom? You see these, this ridge here? There's all divots along here. This is where they found Old Kingdom debris. Copper chisels, artifacts, min minor pieces of, of workmen in these ridges. Also, very important piece of evidence right under the corner of this structure here. They also found a stone that would have been part of the unfinished temple over here, which would tell the Egyptologists that, okay, this was built on top of the Old Kingdom stone, the workmen, all this stuff here is attributed to the Old Kingdom. I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but this is what the Egyptologists use in part to date the Sphinx. However, there could be more below the surface. doesn't mean there wasn't right. any earlier. They might find earlier sometime. And so after leading the group through the Sphinx enclosure, we came back here to the hotel where we're now about to have breakfast. And then I will take the group back to the Giza Plateau where we'll take a look at all three pyramids and some of the more obscure features at Giza. So now we're back on the Giza Plateau, coming off the tour bus here in front of the Pyramid of Khufu. We're about to begin the tour. See, can you put your ticket here? You are up to the platform that was built. Look how tight and look at the size. See the size. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like. And if you like this, I suggest you watch the next two videos I put up on the screen, because these are the videos YouTube thinks you should be watching next. <laughs>